a very good day to, to everybody and welcome to this second webinar in our South South Institute series. My name is Chris Dolan and I'll be moderating today's session. Some of you were with us on the first webinar about a month ago. Um, today's is the second and there will be several more in the lead into the next in-person meeting of the South South Institute which we hope will take place <clears throat> in September this year, COVID allowing. Some of you will no doubt have noticed that we, we no longer use the, the full name, the long name South South Institute on Conflict Related Sexual Violence Against Men and Boys, which was the name we had started with back in 2013. And we, we've dropped the last part, partly because we wanted to avoid compounding a very simplistic male, female gender binary. And partly also because we recognize that as has long been said about sexual violence against women in conflict settings, such violence represents in certain respects a, con a particular place on a continuum of violence that um, is evident in, both, evident in both war and peace settings. Today, therefore, we're looking at um, a study from what normally people would regard as a peacetime setting, South Korea. And it's a piece of research that explored the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse of boys in South Korea. And it included a legal analysis, a service provider survey, and importantly, the voices of boys affected by, by sexual abuse. And to give us an insight into that work, we have two presenters today, Sunhye Kang and Jarrett Davis, who will speak for about 25 minutes. Then we're going to get a couple of commentaries from Ken Clearwater and Alistair Hilton. And we'll then take Q&As that have been posted into the Q&A uh, section. And <clears throat> we'll, we'll see how many of those we can address in the 30 or so minutes that are available. Any questions that we don't manage to answer during the, the Q&A session, we shall respond to subsequently. And as you're aware, the, <coughs> the, the session is being recorded. So we'll have a full um, copy of the whole event and that will subsequently be posted as well. It gives me a great pleasure now to introduce Sun Hye Kang. Sun, whom we, we refer to as Sun for short, and Sun has a background in criminology and child protection. Um, even as a student, she wanted to do work on sexual exploitation and abuse of boys, but I learned yesterday was blocked from doing so. However, she has since found the opportunity to pursue this interest um, with Tactinel and Ekpat Korea, with whom she has worked for the last three years as the head of International Cooperation Unit. And as part of that work in 2020, 2021, she worked with her team to develop a research project exploring the sex, sexual exploitation and abuse of boys in South Korea, which we understand is the very first study of its kind in South Korea. So we're very grateful to you, Sun, for giving us a, an overview of your findings. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. I was actually preparing myself for the introduction, but you gave us such a great introduction for me. So I, so I guess I can just go right into my presentation. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, today I will share about the sexual exploitation of boys in Korea and our project with the boy survivors that uh, Chris kindly described. And, um, before we go into our study, I would like to give you some background information about how is it is in Korea and what's our cultural context. Uh, um, in before 2013, Criminal Act in Korea defined the sexual victims as women, which would exclude all the other genders. So, but after the revision, Korean government decided to change it to person, a more uh, genderless definition, should I say. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thus, in legal terms, there should be no difference in genders when in ide identifying the victims of sexual crimes. Uh, according to the Sunflower Center, you know, the National Support Center for Victims of Sex Crimes in Korea, the number of sexually abused boys are increasing every year, and new types of crimes against boys are appearing. Uh, for example, because of the internet development, there are so many cases of online grooming and the systems of the boys are being reported uh, every day and more and more. And, but however, the, despite the change in the legal system and the rapidly increasing crimes, there are still lack of awareness in various parts of Korea society. Um, you can see is that in Korean culture, the gender norms that men have to be strong and able to protect themselves when they place many biases against the male victims. And even among the service providers, they hold certain bias in victim identification, making it difficult for boys to disclose and receive support. And many child protection centers, especially centers for sexually abused children, uh, they focus mainly on girls and women. So most of the centers specifically mention that they are for girls and women. So it's really difficult for the boys and men to approach to the center to ask for the help. And because of this prevalent discrimination and lack of awareness, there is less desire to study this issue in Korea. And there's very few reports and data about the sexual exploitation of the boys. Um, so with this background, ECPAD Korea has decided to participate in ECPAD International's Global Project on Boys. Uh, in 2020, we began this research on the sexual exploitation of boys in Korea and published the final report in 2021. And you can find this in our official website of the ECPAD International. And this report includes the legal analysis and survey on frontline workers and conversation with the boys. Uh, this report explains the gender norms in Korea, or what it's like to be a boy in Korea and how this gender norm influenced the system and the boys' real experience in seeking help and their recommendation for the system. Uh, in the survey, we collected 56 people who are working directly uh, with sexually abused children and ask them about their knowledge on the sexual exploitation of boys and gender norms and their perspectives by giving the scenario in different types of boys' cases. And Jared can explain more details about the result of the survey, which shows clear, uh, clearly about the underlying bias among those uh, service providers after my presentation. But for now, I would like to focus on the conversation with the boys. Uh, it's basically a group activity with boy survivors to hear their experience and thoughts about this issue. But because it was very first group activity tried in Korea with boy survivors, so we faced many difficulties even before starting the project. Uh, my colleagues, Oh, I'm missing this plus button somehow. Sorry about that. <laughs> but this is supposed to be a positive side. But um, my colleagues were worried that uh, if this project might cause risk for the boys and not a good for the boys. And uh, they thought that all the counselors and facilitators are not ready to handle this work because of the lack of experience with the boys. And this may cause the critics to attack the organization. And the biggest concern was that recruiting of the boys, everyone believed that who would join the, uh, who would participate in such activity. And they believe the parents and counselors gonna be against it and they would not allow the boys to join. So, but despite this or these concerns, we saw a really good side of this. And we believe that there are many positive sides which can hear the boys' voices, the actual voices of the boys. And it's very important to include boys in action and hearing what boys actually go through and feel in this uh, time of difficulty. 
And also we strongly believe that this can be a huge step for boys to actually overcome their victimization and regain their confidence as a leading person, not a victim. Ah, here it is. <laughs> so we decided to push forward this project and think of the ways to overcome the challenges. Uh, we prepared four weeks of training for the facilitators and counselors to talk about ethical approaches for the boys and the gender norms and vulnerability of the boys and the techniques to work with the boys. This really helped our team to build their confidence. And by the end of the program, our team was able to uh, develop their own activities for the boys suitable, also suitable for the cultural context. And we made sure to find a child-friendly space. You can see in the middle picture. Um, we wanted the child-friendly space because we wanted to provide a safe and comfortable environment during the activity. We didn't want this to be very strict and a classic setting, which can uh, make the boys uh, not comfortable. Also, we designed the a promotional poster to encourage the boys to join. And also we made a consent and assent form for the boys and the parents. And we tried to check every process uh, of recruiting of the boys because we thought this was a very crucial part of our preparation. Uh, and finally, we got to meet the boys in our space. And these are the pictures of the activity that we did with the boys. We wanted to make sure that this activity is not like a sit down in the uh, sit down conversation face to face with the counselors. We wanted to make this fun and enjoyable for the boys. So we started our project by building rapport and we played the room escape game using this very fancy screen room. And we also played other games which can be connected to our next part of the activity. Uh, after building rapport, we, we didn't want to go straight into the deeper conversation, which can make, which can upset the boys. So we had an opening up conversation, uh, watching videos and discussing about what gender is and what gender norms they face every day in life. And this is our main part of the study. And we use this live gender graph. You can see in very left picture uh, is what we use for the survivors to describe what they go through. So using this graph, boys can share their experience and share what happened actually and how it affected his life afterwards. And using this tree activity on the right, uh, boys explored needs and gaps of receiving help after victimization and they gave recommendations to improve the system. Um, you can see more details about this activity in the report. You can just read it from it. And since there were many concerns that this activity might cause the boys to record the hard memories, we wanted to conclude this by playing some fun but meaningful activities with the boys. You can also find the details about it, what this little jar is in from our report. Um, uh, on the right, I just want to quickly mention what it is. This may look very strangely for many of the, our participants. This is actually the certificate for the boys that we gave to the boys. We made sure that we keep our contact with the boys after, after the activity and to make sure that boys are okay after participating um, our project. So we kept the follow-up meetings with the boys and in the one of the meeting, we gave this certificate for the boys and we nominated them as a, a protector of boys, right? And this really gave them confidence to raise their voices and act proactively. So after the activity, we collected all the data and quotations from the boys and we analyzed them. And you can see here is a word cloud of what boys said during the opening of conversation about the gender. And this described the gender norms that boys face within the culture, which influenced them 
we influence them deeply and their emotions, their thoughts, and even decision making at the time and after the victimization. You can find here that like don't compete with girls and men are good at all sports and men don't cry and you need to be tough. And this kind of masculinity culture gives a voice to hard to admit that they have been victimized and they're actually suffering emotionally. And these are the quotations directly from the boys. I did not want to alter them. So I just simply um, translated them into the English. And this each quote, quotation shows the lack of awareness and how boys are misunderstood by others and the loopholes of our support system for the boys. One of the boys said that on the right side, one of our boys said that, I don't know why they call it national if they only support the girls and women. So he said it because he was rejected from five other centers before he finally got to us. And another boy expressed a slight disappointment and confusion that something was wrong, definitely wrong with him, but someone, but no one noticed it. And this kind of points out that the uh, lack of awareness about the sexual exploitation of, against the boys and how people see the misbehaviors of the boys as a danger, not something, the sign of trauma. And the most uh, hidden message that I received was that he was uh, on the right side. I was scared that the police would arrest me too. I asked the boy, why didn't you report it to the police? And oh, how was, what was your thoughts and how was your feeling? And he said he was very scared that because he was involved in this activity, he thought he was a part of the crime. So he was afraid that he wouldn't be considered as a victim and he would be considered as delinquent. So this really shows the reality straightforward. And so for the entire project, we uh, combined the results from the survey and the conversation with the boys. And we could learn that boys and the service providers have very different perspective about the current supporting system. And because the counselors and the social workers view the sexual exploitation of boys as a very unique and difficult case the, that only specialists can treat. So people are uh, sending boys to other centers where they believe to have better professionals and better uh, like system and spaces. So they were actually doing it for the boys, not, not because they don't want to uh, treat them they thought they are not good enough to treat the boys and they want the boys to receive better program in the better center and because in Korea we have very neatly uh, connected a uh, network between the counseling centers so we can refer the cases to another center which considered more appropriate so that's why they've been referring boys to another center but the boys kind of saw it differently boys thought that uh, they, they took it as a rejection and as and being unwelcomed from the system. So it gave them hard time to open their heart and disclose what they actually think and feel. And, and boys starting to consider that this system is not for the boys, only for the girls and women. And the other outstanding finding was the misunderstanding of boys' behavior after victimization. Some boys had a very hard time describing his experience and feelings verbally. So boys can express it through the different behaviors uh, like drinking, smoking, or heavy gaming involving in dating app or even, sh even showing sexual behaviors. But compared to people's knowledge and girls' trauma and possible change of behavior after victimization, there is very low understanding of boys and bias against the boys. So the parents and teachers take this be change of behavior as a delinquency or even danger and sometimes puberty, simply puberty. So boys are often sent to a wrong program like a delinquent correction. So actually one of our boys who participated in our project, uh, he came to us as a sexually misbehaving child required to receive sexual education that we provide for the sexually misbehaving ch children. Uh, but later on our counselor found out that he actually had an experience of sexual abuse um, prior to the change of behavior. So, um, 
from this artist finding, these are the main messages of our project. And not like people's assumption that boys don't talk and they do not cooperate. Boys are willing to actually share their stories and opinions when they feel safe and respected. And we need better education or training programs for the um, service providers, frontline workers and counselors and any other people who's working directly with the sexually violated children um, in order to encourage them to work with the boys and give more confidence so they can treat the boys rather than sending them to others. And most importantly, we need to acknowledge that what we think is good for the boys does not always match with what, what boys actually want all the time. That is why we need to include boys' voices into our study and actions and treat them not just a survivor or victim as a, someone who has a right to uh, show, show their um, opinion and, and engage into our activities. So um, I would like to conclude my presentation with uh, sharing a little bit of the experience of what we had. Our team really faced many difficulties before and during the project, but I can say this was totally worth trying. Uh, we had many difficulties like COVID-19 came up and there's uh, um, parents and counselors didn't want to allow their boys to even hear about this program. But um, I believe that this project is the first huge step towards further research and programs for the boys in Korea. And I expect to see more studies and actions from everybody else for the boys in Korea and any other countries who are um, having the same similar problems. And thank you for listening to my presentation. And now I would like to give my floor to Jared, who will share more details about the survey on uh, frontline workers. I will stop my screen. Thank you so much, Sun Ye. That, that was such a fantastic presentation and very concise and great, great slides as well. Um, just as, as the slides for Jared come up, um, just a reminder, we have a very good group of participants. Please do use the Q&A to post your questions or comments to Sun or to Jared, who's about to present. Um, I think we've, we've seen, I'm sure that people who are listening are seeing all sorts of parallels between mm -hmm. the situation where you're working and the situation as described uh, thus yeah. far by Sam. And Jared's yeah. going to take us a bit further into that in terms of an overview of the, the findings from a survey that was part of the research. Just to say a few words about Jarrett Davis, he's an independent social researcher and a consultant who's lived and worked in Southeast Asia for 12 years until recently locating to New York City. Most of his body of work, which is quite considerable, has been related to research with children and uniquely vulnerable groups in the Philippines, Thailand and Cambodia, often exploring issues related to sexual violence, exploitation and abuse. And that's, that's involved work with a number of different organizations, including ECPAT International, UP International, the Nexus Institute, First Step Cambodia, Terre des Hommes Netherlands, and many others. And we were happy to first meet Jarrett at the South South Institute that was held in Phnom Penh in 2015. And we're very happy now, Jarrett, to, to hear more from you about this particular piece of, of, of work in South Korea. So please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris, and uh, and thanks, Sun. Yeah, as Chris said, well put, very concise. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm Jarrett, and um, for many of you, I I um, I imagine these findings are not greatly different from what uh, you may know in your context, wherever that may be. Um, so I thought it might be helpful for me to zoom out a bit on the larger project and put some of these findings into context. <clears throat> Uh, this research was a part of the uh, Global Boys Initiative on, on uh, Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation under ECPAT International, which attempted to better understand boys' access to services for sexual abuse and exploitation, as well as the quality and effectiveness of those services in six nations, which were, were uh, South Korea, Hungary, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, Morocco, and Bolivia. Um, <laughs> needless to say, though, um, there's so much data, far, far more than I could 
ever cover in 12 minutes, which is twice the amount of time that I've actually been given. So I will be brief <laughs> and encourage you to reach out with questions. Um, <clears throat> So at first, the study attempted to draw a sample from support workers in services that were intentionally inclusive of boys, but this proved to be very difficult in several nations as our partners struggled to find enough support workers with any specific experience working with boys. Thus, the research sample was broadened to include support workers who provide child protection services. Uh, in analyzing the data, though, uh, one of the most perhaps glaring findings was that there seemed to be little common understanding of A, who a frontline support worker was, and B, what role they played in the lives of their communities, lots of diversity in different countries. So in Sri Lanka, India, and Pakistan, we found a large range of people working in a variety of roles in the relief and development sectors. Um, farther north on the globe, we've, our partners in Korea um, and Hungary identified more support workers who were considerably more specialized. Um, and included more individuals um, with specific treatment-based backgrounds and trauma and psychology. Um, on South Korea, the 56 workers in our sample, when we were uh, interviewing those uh, support workers, were um, highly educated, the majority having a master's or PhD level education. Um, all but four were women. Many came from um, more formal, clinical, or sort of psychotherapeutic backgrounds. And that was sort of their approach that they took with um, a lot of their work. So while a third had, um, well, a third of them had at least some education in social work, had at least some education in social work, a lot of them came from that more structured, uh, formal background. Um, Casework was often medicalized for treatment based rather than relying on more ecological approaches um, involving the child's family and, and community in a lot of the, the cases that, that, that we saw in the research. So, um, everyone provided some form of mental and physical health services and nearly all provided one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, so the South Korean caseloads were, overall the, the data, were the most heavily imbalanced in terms of gender. And you can see here on some of these boxes on the screen that the pink and the blue are showing the uh, sort of the, the gender ratios of each uh, of the caseloads. Um, <clears throat> so girls were very well represented in caseloads of support workers. Um, this is coming from over the past month. Nine cases had only girls, 26 had 80% or more girls. Seven were between 40 and 60% girls. 14 are majority boys. However, a lot of these are drawn, uh, a lot, however, many of these are social workers drawn from the criminal justice um, uh, programs um, working in South Korea. While these support workers' um, jobs did fall within the inclusion criteria and they could provide you know, services uh, for sexual victimization or referrals. Um, most support workers were trained to address what uh, was termed sexual delinquency, I think, as, as uh, Sun mentioned earlier, and not necessarily looking for the signs and symptoms of abuse for the, the, the people that they're working for. So Sun observed in her presentation um, about a bias among service providers. Um, so I thought I would pull out a little bit of, of, of data here to kind of demonstrate that. Um, it was clearly shown in the data. Um, so in separate sections, for instance, this one question here, um, in separate sections of the survey for both boys and girls, um, support workers were asked, what are the difficulties in identifying a child who has experienced CSEA? So they were asked this for boys and then separately asked in another section later for girls. Um, while we didn't initially plan to do this, this in the analysis, we ended up doing a side-by-side -side comparison of those responses that the, resport, the support workers gave. Um, for boys and girls and found some interesting patterns. So many responses, while different, were often very similar in meaning. It, um, it was often reported that boys don't want services, that they are stubborn or they're hard to build rapport with. Some even reported being uncomfortable working with boys due to the fact that they, as a service provider, were women. Uh, for instance, here, respondent 40, uh, <laughs> for boys answering this question, she notes they don't talk deciding that this is an importantly, that this is an important um, difficulty in uh, identifying boys who have been abused. For girls, she notes though, that, that it's not as difficult to identify them as victims due to the fact that many of them are referred through the system, which likely involves a well-worn referral pathways in the um, uh, social service system. I'm sure Sun um, can speak more on that. 
during the question and answer portion. <laughs> um, respondent 56 here, for instance, um, for boys notes that boys talk about being sexually exploited like it's a normal experience um, and says they don't want help. Others note how they act up or say that they're just fine um, when, when asked directly, when kind of confrontationally asked about their, their things. Um, while for girls, um, the same respondent, the same respondent highlights, and probably maybe rightly, that support services for girls are under-resourced. Um, but there's, um, but then when it comes to gender or any other well-defined social construct, um, it's important to realize that um, we often see what we expect to see uh, based upon the assumptions that we hold. Um, this isn't as much a critique of social workers in the study at all, um, as it is just a general sociological reality <laughs> um, that, um, that we all um, as humans face. Um, but this can have considerable implications for children um, who have been abused or exploited. The same words or behaviors can be interpreted very differently depending on these assumptions, just as women with opinions can be labeled as bossy, while boys can be boys with the same analogous behaviors can be labeled as leaders. It also works the other way, and in other other scenarios, um, this labeling. Um, I don't want your help. Uh, may be interpreted as being afraid, while for boys it can be interpreted as pride. Uh, these are the sort of filters, these you know the cultural filters that we sort of um, see the world through. If the child remains silent for, for girls, it might be, might, it, it could very well be interpreted as, as being traumatized because that's what we would expect to see, maybe, if we have those assumptions about who girls are and who boys are. Whereas for boys, you might see them as being stoic, um, acting out, acting up, being hyper. For girls, this, due to training and preparation and, and referral pathways, it's likely that those may be identified as PTSD symptoms, rightly so. Um, whereas for boys, it may just be seen as bad behavior. Um, so I will, um, I'll, I'll leave you all with, with this um, a little cartoon that I made here. Um, <clears throat> so I note the quote that Sun shared earlier um, from the boy, and I'll give you some background on the boy who said that he was scared that the police would arrest him too. And I, if I remember right, I believe Sun can, can you know, go into this is, is he was especially afraid. And this is something that happens commonly. So he was especially afraid that during the abuse, um, he had a physical reaction. He, he got an erection during the abuse, which is common, a common physiological response um, that, that, um, that to stimulation. Um, and because of that, not knowing, not being, being, being told about, you know, his, his body and those things, he felt worried. Um, his feelings are not necessarily unjustified. <laughs> Um, boys often have this additional set of qualifications um, that they may need to pass before they can get help. If, if a boy gets abused, um, there may be questions such as, you know, will he become an offender? This is very common. I hear this constantly. Um, was he really abused or was he just messing around sexually? Why didn't he stop it? He had an erection, so he must have allowed it to happen. He must have enjoyed it. He must have been a participant. So these, some of these assumptions then are, are kind of baked into the system, really. Um, and a lot of boys run the risk where it may be difficult to get support for trauma, but it might be easier to get support for being a misbehaving child where they may risk other things such as, you know, punishment, being labeled as a bad kid, having those sort of self-fulfilling prophecies as the child develop, develops. Um, often grouped with other traumatized boys who commonly bully and further traumatize the child, which um, is something that I'm sure anyone who works with boys is fairly familiar with. An important thing to remember, um, and just closing for me, uh, is that um, boys are scared too. They're traumatized too. Uh, boys and men, long after the fact, suffer the impacts of PTSD too. Um, so I think that's, um, I'm going to leave you with that. Um, welcome any questions and uh, discussion. And, um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jared. That's uh, a wonderful segue from <clears throat> from Sun's presentation. Um, and I, I think 
to me, the thing I take away from it is that, I mean, the key message, I don't know how you boil down so much data into such a concise presentation, but the key message that when, when it happens to boys, they become delinquents or are, become seen as delinquent. When it happens to girls, they're seen as traumatized. And yep. that's the kind of the biggest, the overarching um, systemic issue that we need to, to tackle. Yeah. Um, and I, I know you can you can talk at length and in much more detail. So thanks for managing to keep it so concise. Um, I'm going to turn now quickly to to our two commentators, both of whom were involved right from the beginning in setting up the South South Institute. And I'm going to turn first to Ken to give us a few observations on 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 what we've heard today, and then to Alistair. Um, Ken is a very, very, I would say, world-recognized leader on male survivor issues, and you know, has really helped to bring attention to this issue, particularly in New Zealand, but also globally, and has been recognized for, for this work with many awards. Um, are you an OBE? I've forgotten the exact title you have, Ken, but anyway, you can tell us. So an, an, ONZ, an ONZM, yeah. which is a, it's a New Zealand equivalent to an OBE, but I didn't get mine from the Queen like Duncan did. Right, okay. Well, you're <laughs> not left for that. Uh, anyway, Ken, over to you. I'd, I'd, we'd love to hear your observations on these two great presentations that we've just had this, this today. Thanks, thanks, Chris. And for those who don't know me, I'm um, Ken Cleota from New Zealand. Um, I was the former national advocate for male survivors here in Aotearoa and was an original board member of Male Survivors, which was set up in 1997 in Christchurch by male survivors for male survivors working from a peer support model. Um, so what um, uh, we've been talking about today fits, fits well with, with the work we've been doing, and I'm honoured. Uh, to sit beside Chris and, and Alistair. Uh, we met after a conference in, in 2012, of course, in New York and Central Park, and, and Chris had the idea about the South South, which I felt fitted perfectly with the work we were doing here in New Zealand. Uh, thank you, Sam and, and Jarrett, uh, for your presentations, uh, which shows we still have a long way to go, and that this is a, a global problem um, in, in the lack of data, the lack of research, mm. The lack of training and especially the lack of funding uh, to understand and, and work with male victims of sexual trauma. Uh, it's great to be here beside Sun. I'm, I'm a great believer we can only um, change things uh, by um, for males by working beside our female colleagues and I know that um, it's been a big part for me here in New Zealand. I wouldn't have been able to do the work that I'm doing here in New Zealand if it wasn't for the female colleagues that that we work with and I think it's uh, it's important because when we talk about men and boys people think we're taking sides and we're actually not we just want to make sure that the men and boys get the support they need and so we've been pretty pretty lucky to have some amazing women um, there's a worldwide lack of understanding of male survivors and the lack of training um, the professionals that are working in this field um, education system that fails to accept and acknowledge male victims of sexual trauma and I know that in New Zealand, I, the, the women's agencies over here can go into the schools and talk about female victims of sexual trauma. We're not allowed to go into the schools and talk about male victims of sexual trauma. And nobody's been able to give us a reason for that. Uh, for me, this work is not complicated. What makes it complicated to me is the DSM and the medical model. Uh, sexual violence is not a, a, a diagnostic disorder. Uh, it's a criminal act and it's committed against uh, uh, human beings, mostly vulnerable, and it's committed against male and females. Uh, vulnerable human beings and boys are part of these crimes. How they react may be different. And um, Sun and Jared have both talked about that. Currently in New Zealand, we have a Royal Commission, which is looking into the abuse of children in um, children's homes um, and also Catholic homes and orphanages in this country. And what's come out of it is most of the uh, men that were sexually abused as boys had gone on either the prison system, um, the mental health system, or uh, living on the streets or taking their own lives because the people within those systems had no idea how to look after or work with those men and even allow those men to come, to come forward and speak. 
Um, I believe that what we do is simple, um, not complicated, and the system around the world seems to make it complicated. And, and I was honoured in 2013 when Chris set up the, uh, the first SSI in Uganda. We brought, we brought 30 male survivors together over a period of time, and, and Alistair and Chris and I got to spend some time with those men from, from Rwanda, from the Congo, um, a lot of all refugees that had come into Uganda that the Refugee Law Project that were looking after. And these men were traumatised, not just with being refugees, but also what they had suffered in, in, in sexual violence. But when we got them together and we sat them down, and it was about what would you like to do? What would you like to happen? And what would you like the professionals and the agencies and the government and everything to know what you need for you, which made a safe place because they were in control of the whole process, which is very similar to what Sun's talking about with working with young boys. It's making a, a safe space. And um, when I first went there and saw the trauma that these men had been through, I thought I was out of my league. But the moment they were given that space to talk, it just opened those men up and it was an incredible honour to be part of it. And there was also five different languages. Um, we didn't try to fix or medicate them or tell them what they needed. We simply made a safe space for them to share what they needed and what they wanted to tell the professionals. And to me, it doesn't get any more simple than that. And we certainly didn't need the BSM or any clinical model to work with that. I'm not sure what the fear is, when it comes to speaking about or supporting male victims of sexual trauma. I suppose it's maybe because um, here in New Zealand, we're a colonised country, as are many around the world. And I wonder whether that patriarchal system just does not allow males to be victims. And for some reason, our society and our world is that sick that's accepted male, uh, sorry, females and women and girls are victims. Well, you know, that, even that's not right because not all women are victims and not all girls are victims. And certainly not all men are perpetrators. So we need to open those stories up as well to let those men and boys know that they can come forward and, and talk about this stuff. And um, once again, I'm just honoured to be part of this amazing journey with the South South Institute. And um, hopefully that the people that are listening in we will get to meet you in the, in the Netherlands in September, all the COVID going well. So uh, thanks again, Chris, for giving me the opportunity. And um, you've got my email. If there's anybody who wants to answer questions or ask questions, I'm more than happy to do with it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ken. And as usual, managing to span right from the sort of nitty gritty at grassroots levels right up to the bigger systemic questions about you know what what is bringing this about what kind of patriarchal systems are we struggling within that don't allow people to speak and how do we create the safer spaces for people to begin to to be able to speak um i'm going to, I'm going to turn now quickly to to alistair and alistair along with ken and myself we were was very much part of getting the south south institute and the discussions around it moving back in 2013 and is is really a driving force also behind these webinars <clears throat> and and getting us to the fifth institute in september i hope um and al has really extensive experience in work with male survivors having been part of setting up or i think being the lead in setting up first step back in the uk in the 1980s and first step cambodia subsequently and with a particular interest in how service providers deal with these issues. Um, mm. So we've heard today quite a lot about, about the service providers and the ga gaps in their understandings. It'd be really great to hear your comments on that. Alistair, mm. the floor is yours too. Thanks, uh, Chris. I hope my uh, internet um, signal holds out. It's often a bit erratic, but... Um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I did prepare some notes, but I'm also aware of some really interesting questions coming in. So I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Um, but firstly, I just want to acknowledge that I did work quite closely with Sun and her team in Korea. And it was, I have to say, one of the best professional experiences of my life, working uh, with people uh, in a very different culture to my own that were very committed 
to addressing this issue. And I think they did a great job and they've laid a firm foundation for the future. Um, one of the statistics that Jarrett shared actually in his presentation that I kind of forgot about was that of the survey, and this was repeated in many countries, 93% of those service providers were women. It's really hard to find men who are doing this work. And I think that both men and women need to do this work to at least offer choices. Um, but I think there are, there are issues there that I'm sure we can perhaps talk about in the discussion. But I think overall, I'd like to comment how, you know, so many of our understandings and our perceptions of gender and what people might call gender bias do cast a whole shadow across this, this whole field in a sense. And I think that's problematic for us. It's certainly a problem, I think, for survivors seeking services and seeking help. It's certainly a problem, it seems to be, for many people trying to provide services and institutions. It's a problem for parents and families and communities that ultimately do not always recognize the vulnerability of boys and how um, boys, when they are abused or exploited, might uh, present themselves. And that's true, I think, in career and many other settings. I think that what stood out for me uh, in, in career as in other places is that essentially the whole system and the institutions that uh, form that um, very commonly view women as victims. And that's not to say that services for women and girls are adequate, because they're not in most, if not all places. But the groundwork has been laid, I think, in terms of learning and training, and that prepares the workforce and services to actually work with women and girls. But that's definitely not the same for boys. And we do see that, um, that they're expected to fit into a system that wasn't designed or prepared to meet their needs. And as one of the boys said in the study, we feel not welcome because we're passed around from service to service. Now, with all the best will in the world, some providers might do that because they think and feel that, well, I'm not good enough, so I need to find somebody else. But just imagine what that's like searching and seeking support, and that could be quite um, a dreadful experience for them. But I think that shadow, if you like, of, of the way gender, a caustic shadow over boys as well, you know, they, they do struggle to find help and to tell and disclose. Um, we can't find services. They, they struggle to find people to listen. Um, I think in this study and the study in Hungary, boys talked about, I tried to show people through my behavior that there was a problem, but people didn't notice or they dismissed me as a problem or I would get detention or I would be punished. And this is very common. Um, and I, I often call that as a, you know, that, that training, that lack of training, if you like, leaves uh, boys trying to find help from what I call a deficit model, which sees them as less than good, less than vulnerable. Um, and, and previously that's been uh, described by others as uh, the feminization, perhaps, of victimization, where women and girls are seen as victims, and boys are seen as offenders and perpetrators, and women can't be offenders and boys um, cannot be victims. And I think that that's still part of the challenge for us. Um, the ideas that um, came out through some of the, the comments that Sun made about boys don't talk or they don't want help, very familiar. And I've often heard people say, well, you know, they don't need help, they can recover quickly, you know, um, or they joke about this as if they don't care, not realizing, and that failure to recognize how gender affects boys, um, that that actually might be a, 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 a quite a, an obvious coping mechanism for many boys, is that joking about what happened as if it doesn't matter is the way that men and boys cope with a lot of tragedies and trauma in their lives. But the training is missing that. We're not helping service providers understand and look through a, um, a gender lens. We know that men and boys do want help and we know that they need it, but it may look very different to that that's provided to girls and systems are not always very good at developing training or referral pathways or engaging with boys or providing the tools for service providers to do the job. The environment that we provide services might look different. The way we communicate might look different. The way that we encourage and make it available for us to access services might look very different from those traditional services. And we really do need to get to grips with that. Um, but what I would say is, uh, and I'm coming to the end of my clip thing, is that we can learn such a great deal from people like Ken in New Zealand and the Refugee Law Project in Uganda, for example, who have 
provided services for men and women uh, and people of diverse identities in really challenging circumstances, in very hostile circumstances. And it can be done, it can be achieved. So I think there's a lot to learn from each other. And um, one of the strengths, I think, of the work that Refugee Law Project has done is they listen and they keep on listening and they don't stop listening to the people they work with and they are involved in the design and the creation of services. Um, just to, con to, to conclude, really, um, we often hear the term trauma-informed practice or trauma-informed research, and um, you hear it a lot, but often it's not because it's not inclusive, because as far as I'm concerned, trauma-informed is gender-informed, and so much and so many of the services we have are not fully gender-informed, and I think we need to do whatever it takes to achieve that. Um, and I think we need to close the gaps that exist in research and learning and listening and practice and training and challenge those, those models and practices and institutions that do not uh, meet the needs of boys and further isolate them. Now we have to work more, it's essential I think, to work more closely with families and caregivers, especially fathers, because often we don't engage with fathers enough to support many parents in Cambodia and actually that was echoed in Korea, just don't know how to help their children and end up feeding into some of those, um, those harmful gender norms which further isolate boys and push them away. So we do need to change the narrative just as Sun and her team have begun to do in Korea um, to challenge and, and actually be disruptive and ask the difficult questions of managers and organisations and funders. Um, we do need to be more inclusive because we need to address issues of homophobia within services uh, and, and our societies and culture to enable all people to gain services. And uh, children with disabilities are often completely neglected. And so that's maybe for a future webinar. But to end, I think that um, there's, there's almost 60 people here on this webinar, but we're all at very different stages of our journey of change. Um, 25 years ago, Ken was working in New Zealand, campaigning with government to get a royal commission, and nobody was listening. Successive governments turned them down, and finally that was achieved this year in 2022. So hats off to Ken and all those colleagues he's worked with, because it proves that if we keep on working at this, we can make really huge and significant change. Um, so I think that for those that are at the beginning of their journey, perhaps wanting to do research or wanting to access learning materials, don't give up because there is a growing community, not just the South South Institute, um, but in other areas. Um, and contact us through the um, South South Facebook page or the Refugee Law Project, and we can put you in touch with people that can support um, the work that you're doing. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair, and for drawing the parallels and the connections between so many different locations, <clears throat> as well as the need for considerable endurance in this work. Um, and <laughs> giving the example of Ken in New Zealand going back into the 90s, calling for yeah. a commission. Thank you very much for all of that. Uh, we now have about 20 minutes left before the end of this webinar. Um, we have two options. One is that you put your questions into the Q&A box and then they get allocated by myself. Or you can raise your hand and I'm able to, I think I'm able to unmute you. So I'm going to try that with uh, John Aleng Opoka who has a hand raised. I'm going to allow you to talk. Can you give us your comment please, John? Oh, thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, I, I made a few observations. I'm a field staff and I work in uh, Lamore Refugee Settlement. Uh, during our Uganda, implementation. For people who don't know Lamore. Oh, uh, uh, Lamore Refugee Settlement is in Uganda, in Northern Uganda as such. Yeah, uh, during implementations, we are really able to identify a number of areas that has limited boys and men from actually coming up and uh, seeking for support even when they really need it. Uh, one of them is that uh, when you look at our environment at the moment, we have restricted uh, safer places or spaces 
that limits the boy child and the men from accessing services. Because most of these safer spaces are labeled as women safe space and girls safe space. Technically already the men are not allowed into these places. So it makes their access to services really limited. Uh, secondly is that uh, our families and communities put a lot of demand on the male uh, gender, making them really unable to, during their daily lives, go through the different emotions that they experience and process all the troubles that they've gone through during the day or in their process to provide for their families. All this pressure does not really give the boys and the men time to access services as our families keep demanding from them every now and then. Uh, the other point is that um, there is a bit of ego among this, the men, uh, and this is all uh, contributed to uh, during uh, our cultural practices and the cultural beliefs that we have, because a number of our cultures here in Uganda tells us that boys don't cry. So that is a very harsh belief because as women, boys have emotions too. They too get hurt, they too have feelings and uh, they're supposed to process these feelings. They're supposed to seek help whenever they feel unable to help themselves. But this ego and this cultural beliefs really affects their uh, ability to seek out for help. And as well- I'm gonna stop you there, just so that we give time for other people as well. I think your you. observations are absolutely on point. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have been sent to me. One is from Shane Harrison. Thank you so much, son. First project of its kind in South Korea. It's groundbreaking in many ways. Could you tell us a little about any impacts and any changes you noticed during and or after the project on the boys themselves, on the parents, facilitators, the staff of your organization, and also on the wider provider community? So has doing this project had some visible, brought about some visible changes in your view? That would be one question. I think another question um, was for yourself again, son, as like what challenges you faced as you and as a woman doing this work? I think Alistair mentioned that most of the service providers that we uh, encounter and it was in the data are women. And we can see that all sorts of gender norms and expectations play into, into the whole process, whether as a service provider or whether as a, as a victim. So it would be great to get uh, some observations from, from you on those. And when we, if, you, if you would be happy to go with those two questions, and then I will come back to the, the hands that I'm seeing raised. I have a hand from Ajok Diana, another from uh, Conrad Kimbugwe. And I would like to take the opportunity also to, to invite, not to compel, but to invite a couple of people that I see amongst the participants who haven't maybe written a question or haven't commented, but who might wish to. Um, particularly Angelo Fernandez, I know you've, you've, you've been doing groundbreaking work in Portugal and it would be really great maybe to get your comments on how has that been and how does, how does what you've learned in Portugal connect to what we're hearing about South Korea? We have Eme Izilaba, who is the former president of Men of Hope in Uganda, um, now living in the United States. Again, it would be great to hear any, any comments you have. Um, Lara Pasquero, who presented in the first webinar, and you know, is very aware of some of the challenges of getting this, this material incorporated into the curriculum of, of service providers, in her case, humanitarian workers. Mark Cavana, I know you're, you're directly involved in ECPAT. So any of you, if you, if you feel moved to, to make a comment, please just raise your hand and we'll try and squeeze this in in the last 15 minutes. So um, some briefly, you, there are two big questions to you. I don't know if you can respond to them briefly. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chris. I will try to be brief, as brief as possible. <laughs> so, so the per, uh, first question was about the impact that we had after this project and during the project. 
uh, during the activity with the boys, we could actually see that boys are opening up and uh, they were really nervous when they first joined the group and when they were first uh, beginning the activity, they thought it's going to be another education course, like talking to the counselor and very difficult, which they consider very difficult because they had hard time like describing about this. And after we, they find out that it's more like activity that they can like, participate in and they can show their emotions through uh, uh, other ways rather than uh, describing verbally. And you can see them having more confidence and more opening up and more willing to share with us. And even after the project, when it ended, the boys said they want to do something like this again. And they asked us if you are planning to do a, another workshop with them. So we could see that this really gave the positive impact for the boys. And we are still uh, contacting with one boy who's visiting our center and he is recovering very well and he even find another dream and he wants to be a baker and he's kind of improving very well we could see that it really gave him confidence to uh, live his life on his own and by providing we gave them safe place that he can visit and it's safe uh, and healthy relationship that can he build and uh, and during and after the uh, this project we this also impacted the parents and this change the parents' perspective about their victimization, the boys' victimization, and how to view the boys. And because some of the parents were struggling that struggling to view their son as a victim because they thought he was participating in this action. So this really changed the entire relationship and rebuilt the family. So this came became another a support system for the boys. And also he, it healed the parents too. They were struggling too because they've been kid rejected by the other centers and they thought their son's never gonna get help and never get better. So it even gave them um, time to um, recover themselves. And also our counselor and facilitator, you know, before we begin this project, they really lack of confidence and they were afraid of, of risking the boys and giving the secondary victimization. But after this project, they got confidence and they are willing to engage more activity and even designing more activity with the boys. And uh, they are inviting boys to join. And because we changed our attitudes about it, we are getting receiving more uh, cases of boys from other centers. And we are uh, starting to be known as a center who's supporting the boys as well, and more like uh, supporting all the children's. And that's gonna be my answer for the first one. And I'll be really, I promise, really brief about the second question. <laughs> and my personal difficulty I had was, uh, um, it was really hard to explain what the purpose of this study. It's not just to support the boys and men. It's not taking sides, just like the Ken explained. It's in order to protect all types of children, on all the genders of the children. So that was a clear purpose and just, because I'm a woman, uh, Ken, you said it's really good to have a female um, uh, professional in here, but uh, I faced some of the bias that because I'm a woman, it was really considered strange to have interest in the uh, responding to sexual violence against men and boys. And they were saying, are you supporting homosexuals? And why are you interested? Are you interested in gay? And, <laughs> and there was kind of um, really discrimination that I faced. and. Um, I uh, won't even worry that Chris, in the beginning, you said I had an interest in my uh, in earlier um, uh, profession, but it was failed because uh, people thought because I'm a woman and the participant gonna be a, a male, they can be an uh, inappropriate, inappropriate relationship uh, developed. So this kind of discrimination about me being woman and the victims being men was a uh, personal difficulties, but I think it's slowly changing as awareness goes up. So I think I'm starting to have a positive thoughts about it. That's great. Thank you very much. And I, I think clearly the impacts of the project are extensive and multiple. And you know, I, I think it's very encouraging that, that um, what seems like a discrete piece of research can actually have so many multiplier effects. So I think others, I hope, will be inspired by that and um, set up similar initiatives. Um, and I, I think the, the experience, we, we shall explore more in a, a later webinar with, with some people doing their masters and PhD research and, and hear from them um, 
how what kind of reactions they've had to the topic of, of sexual violence against men and boys. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to compare with, with your experience at, at, in that later webinar. Um, there's a very interesting question, and it, it also relates to something you just mentioned, Sam, but maybe, and the question was actually sent to you from Glenn Miles in Wales, do service providers and those who refer boys understand the difference between sexual abuse and exploitation and being gay? And does your training program include that? And we've heard about the physiological responses that boys and men, and this is something that we, we saw a lot at Refugee Law Project, but there, there are physiological responses, boys and men can get erections as a result of whatever is being done and then that is interpreted as consent and as enjoyment so the, the kind of the relationship between abuse exploitation violence and homosexuality is is a, a challenge we see throughout this discussion in all the different areas and different geographies as well could you give us a comment on that quickly son and then maybe jared you might want to add to that after sam has responded okay uh Thank you for the question. That's really, I I relate to what I just mentioned. And um, during the study, is the other service providers and counselor they receive really high levels of education, of course, and training for the sexual victims and how to treat them. So they do know that they have a knowledge that the being sexually exploited or abused is not equal to being gay or homosexual. Uh, but you know, because people are. Um, unconsciously influenced by the cultural context and the gender norms that they face every day, even though they know in knowledge that it doesn't equal to each other, but there's a little opinions that uh, is there, the uh, sexual victims are not being gay, but some of the boys who's whose abuse have uh, some of the feminine features. So that kind of underlying bias and unconscious um, discrimination is, it does exist. But um, I'm trying to not to overgeneralize all these. It's just case by case. It depends on the understanding of individuals. Thanks, Sam. Jared, did you want to add anything? Because I know sure. this comes up everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, mean, I could even um, I could use just a, a personal anecdote. <laughs> growing up in, um, growing up in. Um, Middle of Ohio, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea of being gay is, you know, when I grew up, was synonymous with being a pedophile. There weren't really, uh, there wasn't really a clear distinction between the two. And because of the taboos, because it was something we don't talk about, oh, oh, he said the word, you know, and this, this was back in the late 80s, yeah, but, but, you know, like, wow, he said, oh, gay, oh, you know, <clears throat> um, because it was so taboo, no one could talk about it. So I, I genuinely, uh, I, I'm gay. I, I came out in my twenties, and I, I, uh, but I, I uh, genuinely believed uh, as a twelve-year-old that um, that I was going to grow up to be a pedophile, that I was going to grow up to be a perpetrator. That's terrifying. I used to babysit children, and um, and be afraid that um, you know, thinking that oh, if they only knew who I really was, not to know that a twelve-year-old is is attracted to children. That's normal to have feelings as a 12 year old. Um, but I wasn't given that understanding, largely because uh, largely because it was too taboo to talk about. So that's my my instance. But that's that's um, there are countless <laughs> instances that I could share of other people's stories as well. Um, this is um, a very common thing and, and, and very uh, detrimental, I think. Thanks, Jarrett. And thanks for sharing that. It's not an easy an easy dynamic to to talk about at all i don't think mm -hmm. um just taking a couple of comments there's one from madeline stennison thank you for a great presentation no question just a comment son i think the methodology of your re research is really inspiring not only collection of data for research but using the research infrastructure to also provide boys a safe space and connection with others that last beyond the project time um George Sebers had to leave early, but looks forward to report, reading the report um, in detail. Zekaria or Chan, thanks for submissions. Very glad that the challenges affecting the boy child are now being given an ear. 
special thanks to RLP for walking the talk in Uganda. And my contribution is introducing programs that advocate for this course in schools with guidance from the technical staff will help us achieve the goal. So talking there to kind of some of the more systemic change that needs to happen. Um, we're really running out of time. I'm gonna give, I've got two hands. I, I want to beg, these are both colleagues, I believe from Refugee Law Project. Can you be super brief and make your comment or your question in 30 seconds so that we give our two panelists time to make any closing reflections before we close? in five minutes from now. I'm going to start with uh, Diana and then go to Conrad, but please keep it extremely brief. Diana, are you hearing us? Can you speak? Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I'm called Ajok Diana from Uganda. I work with Refugee Law Project uh, as a documentation assistant. Um, um, I have a comment. One, uh, like in Uganda here, the cultural norms is very, very, very vital. And it's very complex for a, for a boy child to come out uh, if, in case of any situation, for example, if the, the boy child is sexually harassed, it's very hard for them because culturally they are being known as a strong people. They don't, because when you come out as a, um, a survivor, they will look at you as a woman. So the perception here in Uganda is very com complicated. So that's why it's kind of very hard for boy child to come out. And then another thing, I really thank everyone for the presentation, we have learned a lot. And my question goes to Jared. Uh, as a person who has been uh, working with children and boy child, how have you tried to handle this kind of sexual violence? Uh, because I believe some of the stories are so emotional. As a person we ha who is handling such kind of stories, how have you been handling it as you yourself as a person? Because like for me, I work in archive, uh, there are some of the story which are so emotional and sometimes it affects me as a person. So how have you been handling this? Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Diana. And yeah, the, even at a second hand at a move, listening to a, a tape recording or watching a video or even reading a transcript, you can also be quite severely impacted by some of the stories that, that we hear. Um, Conrad has kindly lowered his hand. I'm, Sorry, there's a, a hand from MRA Anirban Sinha that I'm, I'm not going to take now because we've got literally just three minutes left. I would like to give a, a, an opportunity to San and then Jared to just give us one closing remark before we bring this, this webinar to an end. San. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, this is very good opportunity for me to share the experience and see that um, we are having a similar, very, very similar problems and gender norms within many countries, not only in Korea, in Uganda and New Zealand and uh, UK and USA and everywhere in, um, in our world. And I just want to say that is like the Ken said, we need to work together to raise more awareness about this and talk more about this in not just in Korea, many other countries, I'm sure that this issue is considered as a taboo and something makes people uncomfortable when you're talking about it. And we need to start to think, think differently and say that this is not any other unique or special topic. It's a, it's a prevalent topic that we see every day in life and we need to start um, take actions against it. And not to say that this is kind of taking parts, taking sides in either men and women. I would like to say it is about the child who needs protection. And whether or not you are a woman or a man, we have a right to fight for them and we need to right to protect them. So I'm really glad that you are um, invited in this event and had an opportunity to share my experience and hear others' comments. And thank you so much for it. And look forward to another webinars of this series. <laughs> thank yeah. you so yeah. much, Sun. I think it's it's been great to have you on this on this webinar. And yeah, I'm very sure it will lead to further communications and connections and and further work. I hope so.
Jared, please, your last yeah. closing remark. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll just respond to the, the, the final question. Um, they are talking about sort of how um, I think you, you deal, cope with, with um, you know, things like this. I mean, vicarious trauma is real. Um, and I think it's something that, that every single one of us working in this field has to deal with in one way or another. Um, and each one of us has to, to develop actively, self develop the self awareness. I think to to be monitoring those things because it is real, and it will sneak up on you if you're not careful. Um, but I think um, uh, community is a huge is, is a massive important piece to staying healthy. I think in this field. Um, keeping with people in your field that have had shared experiences, staying close to the field. I mean, I think that if, if you're going to be in the field, close to the field, stay close to people um, and, and stay in, in community, stay in relationships. Um, that's what pulls us through. Um, and uh, don't lose hope. <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's all I, that's what I'll leave you with. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you again to our two panelists. Sun and Jara, I think you'll agree with me, they gave an exceptional set of presentations and their comment, their explanations were very illuminating. Thank you to our two commentators, Alistair and Ken. Thank you, um, thank you to our technical team whom you don't get to see, but who've made it all work. Kaba Funzaki and Onen also in the background. Mm. And finally, to everybody who has taken the time today to spend an hour and a quarter with us in this webinar. We look forward to seeing you all back, I hope, in about a month's time. The invitations will come to you through your emails. And I leave you with Colmus Lugala's question, which is a very interesting one. Dr. Chris, how can I convince someone here that physiological response such as erection is not really a consent? I'm not gonna try and answer that, but everybody should take that question away because it's, it's very critical to this work, whether with men or with boys. And I'm sure we shall come back to it in, in subsequent webinars. So I look forward to seeing you all again in about a month's time. Thank you and very thank much. Thank you for chairing, Chris. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.